And we're going to be speaking on Holy Spirit empowerment today. And I have a very special graphic while we have been on a classic cartoon role that is going to come up there. And I'm sure it's very familiar to many of you. Popeye was one of our family's uh, classic cartoon favorites. Uh, I remember having classic cartoons on a VHS. Anybody remember those? (laughs) On an old VHS. And our kids were sitting on the couch, and there was another person with the kids in an adult body, acting like a kid, also watching especially Popeye. Popeye was my hands-down favorite out of all the classic cartoon characters. But you know, without spinach, Popeye didn't have the power, right? Right. He needed that can of spinach to accomplish what he needed to accomplish. One time, after a can of spinach, he needed to rescue Olive. And those were my favorite parts of the story because he loved Olive so much. And so he turned himself into a kind of jackhammer auger. Imagine doing that to your body. And bored through a stone wall in order to rescue Olive. But I can't quite understand how he could eat that spinach because I don't have good memories of eating spinach in school. Do any of you remember that little nasty pile of spinach? If you liked it, you're abnormal. We need to check you out. We need to call a specialist. That nasty pile of spinach they put on your tray. Who in the world ate it? Way to go. I even eat bland steamed broccoli just for the health of it. But that there stalls me. I wouldn't even insert my fork into it lest it be contaminated when I ate other food. And frankly, it looked like somebody's nose dripped in it. That was the real clincher. You know, the apostles in the New Testament were very concerned. I think my mic fell off. Uh, I need Popeye to really wrench that on me. Uh, Anyway... I need help Uh, in more ways than one. No. Uh, Anyway, maybe it's getting okay this way. You know. Every which way, including loose. Okay. Got to help my old Dutchified friend up here. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know if I want a Scotsman to be working at my ear. There you are, big boy. Thank you, my brother. Love you. You are great. All right. So in the New Testament, after believers got saved, we find that the apostles were very concerned that they entered into a second experience, and that experience being the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I want to read for you from Acts chapter 19, verse 1 to 7. This is going to be one of many texts that I traverse over. This is kind of a topical sermon, and so it doesn't just camp on one text. I have to graft in other texts to make the points that I need to make this morning. But I'm going to read Acts chapter 19, verse 1 to 7, and look especially in this text of Scripture at Paul's concern that these Ephesian brothers, there were 12 of them, who had become believers in Jesus Christ, had received the Holy Spirit. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John, that is John the baptizer's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, 
that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Praise God, we had 16 people baptized here in water as these 12 gentlemen were baptized because they were believers in Jesus at this point. And then it goes on to say, and when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now I wanna step back a little bit from this and talk about the prophetic forecast of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And of course, the classical passage of scripture from not the New Testament, but the Old Testament is found in the prophet Joel chapter two. And keep in mind, the prophet Joel wrote his prophecy between the years 835 and 805 BC. Remember the numbers count down before Christ. Between 835 and 805 BC, he was prophesying of things that the apostles, the 120 who waited in the upper room at Pentecost and they were filled with the Spirit, and everybody since has had a promise to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. God planned it just as he planned salvation before the foundation of the world. He planned along with that for those who would receive salvation in Jesus Christ to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit also. And so Joel in his prophecy speaks of that. And the apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2 in explaining what has happened to the curious onlookers and hearers around them, to the 120, when they were stirred in their curiosity, what in the world is going on? Because we hear these uneducated people means they didn't learn different languages. Speaking in other languages the wonderful praises of God, what in the world is going on here? And Peter explains the founder of the Foursquare Denomination, Amy Sempa McPherson, had a wonderful book that she wrote on this. It's called This Is That. Because in the uh, language that is used here in some translations, Peter says, this is that which was spoken of by Joel, by the Holy Spirit. And he says these words in his sermon. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. All flesh is very telling there because the prophets oftentimes spoke uh, words that were limited to the nation of Israel or the southern kingdom of Judah. But here Joel in the Old Testament says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. He's saying God is gonna go global. He's not just to Israel or to Judah, but it is now on all flesh. 835 to 805 years before Christ, he is prophesying this. This is what God, he's saying, has planned for all who believe in the Messiah who I am going to send. That's awesome. And he says this, your sons, and guess who else? for those who are against women in ministry, and your daughters. To me, this is one of the leading, this is one of the leading texts of scripture that stands behind women in ministry. And it's hardly ever used by those who advocate for that. And he says, Father, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my men's servants, and on my maidservants, <laughs> I will pour out my spirit. Praise God. I hope that liberates you. Hallelujah. Then we go to the testimony of John. Some see John the Baptist's ministry almost like an extension of the Old Testament. And the New Testament didn't kick in until Jesus took over or succeeded after John was beheaded. However, it doesn't really matter. Luke chapter three and verse number 16. This was the testimony of John the Baptist about Jesus. Remember when 
uh, John baptized Jesus, he, sp- he saw the Holy Spirit as a dove descending upon Jesus and remaining upon him. And he says this about Jesus. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Even though John's baptism was great, we all need repentance, don't we? We all need change of mind. And it is an expression of what is ongoing in our life. When we see new truth, we change our mind, don't we? Or we can if we choose to, right? We should choose to, hopefully. And so it's a lifestyle, repentance. But in a sense, what John was prophesying is something bigger than what I'm doing is coming. And those of you that have experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit know the bigger, right? (laughs) You can define the bigger. Okay, Jesus himself said in John chapter 14, he says these words. These are such precious words because there's very few times when Jesus says, I will pray. He's described by the gospel writers as going off to pray But Jesus doesn't oftentimes himself say, I will pray. But he says this. He makes sure his disciples know this before he's crucified and before he ascends. I will pray the Father, he says in John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17. And he will send you another comforter. That word comforter in the Greek language is parakletos. And that means one called alongside of you, one called to counsel you, one called to guide you in life, one called you to take of Jesus and teach it to your mind as you walk through your daily life. Then Jesus himself said at the festival of tabernacles in John chapter 7, beginning With verse number 38, Jesus says these very interesting words concerning the coming of the Holy Spirit. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living waters. Now, John does a wonderful thing for us. He interprets what that means. Because he goes on in verse number 39, this is John writing his commentary on that, and it is in the inspired word of God, just as surely as Jesus' words are. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit. So when he talks about living water coming out of us, he's saying it comes by the Holy Spirit. It can come through salvation because the Holy Spirit's called alongside of us, but it comes through the Holy Spirit. It's like emphasis on the work of the Holy Spirit and the immersion in the Holy Spirit. Out of his heart will flow rivers, plural. There's an emphasis on the plurality, on the much water. Like in Ezekiel's vision, in Ezekiel chapter 47, he saw it from shallow to deep that you could only swim in. And he's picturing there the depths of the Holy Spirit that we can walk in. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is where you swim. (laughs) We're talking about swimming today. It's the end of the season, but we're going swimming, folks. (laughs) And so Jesus was, he, John interprets this, and it's, it's wonderful. He says, but this he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him, remember, first believing in him, salvation, i.e. born again, being born again, then, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, they would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified or resurrected and ascended to the Father. These are wonderful promises. Four times in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit coming is worded as the promise, the promise of God, the promise of the Father, indicating this is something God has planned for 
every believer in his son, Jesus Christ. I'll tell you what it's like to me. I'm going to devolve myself down into being an eight-year-old boy again. And let's say my parents promise in a month when you turn nine years old, we're going to have a big birthday party for you. And we're going to invite all of your best friends and your relatives, your cousins and so forth, the ones you like. (laughs) You know, that would be a bad thing, really. This is just hypothetical. Because that kid's not going to sleep for a whole month. (laughs) Dreaming and thinking and being excited about this upcoming birthday party. Do you know what? The Lord showed me that's the way we should look at the promise of the Father. That this is a wonderful experience that he has counted us through the blood of Jesus Christ, cleansing us, worthy of receiving this wonderful gift, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, that we can swim in that fullness today. That's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to define what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And every time I think of asking that question, as I meditated on the message I was thinking back to my high school days. Boy, am I going retro today. And I was, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, we came out with all these corny sayings that meant nothing, but were just fun to say. And Harriet can remember a classmate of ours, Leon, and he, we'd be walking down the hall and he'd be passing me and, and he'd say, what it is, Kutz, what it is. And it's like, who, what? When, where, (laughs) just these silly phrases. And we still, I think at reunions sometimes, throw them up to each other just for the fun of it. So what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, what's in a word? The word that is used to describe the filling of the Spirit, the coming of the Spirit upon an individual's personhood, body, soul, and spirit, God always deals with the whole person, uh, is described as a baptism. Same word for being baptized in water. Being dipped, immersed by submerging. And you know, the word baptism had not just a religious use, it had a secular use. And where it was used in the secular Greco-Roman world of Jesus and Paul's time was in the dye plant. And it was used to describe the uh, baptizo was the Greek verb. And it was used to describe taking a piece of undyed fabric and making sure it is completely submerged for 100% in every thread saturation of the dye, however they did that back then. I worked at Penn Dye, know a little bit about dyeing fabric, but anyway, um, that's what the word, how the word baptizo was used in the secular workplace of Paul and Jesus' time in the Greco-Roman world. And so that dye, as I looked at this and I thought, what's the picture, Lord? The change of color that comes into a person's life when the Holy Spirit baptizes you. I'll tell you what, (laughs) your life gets pretty colorful. When the Holy Spirit is working in your life. I've walked down this road long enough to see a lot of colorful stuff happen in my Pentecostal spirit-filled experience. Really colorful, really charming, really beautiful really beautiful things that happen as a result of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Maybe that's where the saying comes from, dyed in the wool, because we are God's sheep. Are we dyed in the wool, but not only in the wool, in the heart, in the soul also. Now, in the Old Testament, let's look at a little bit of a difference here about the Holy Spirit's role in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament scriptures, such as Numbers chapter 11, verse number 17, where God is speaking to Moses, and the concern is that Moses needs to appoint elders over the nation of Israel as he leads them, 
because it's too much for his shoulders. And, uh, and God says to him, uh, I will take of the spirit that is upon you. Emphasis on the word upon. I will take of the spirit that is upon you and put it upon these 70 elders that were appointed. So the spirit in the Old Testament is upon. When we look and compare that to the prepositions in the New Testament, it is less intimate. And we're going to see how that plays out. Also in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse number 6, when the prophet Samuel came and he found the young man Saul, remember he became the first king of Israel, he encountered him, he prophesied to him, and he said these words. Now you're going to go down the road, Saul, and a school of prophets is going to approach and encounter you. My paraphrase here. And the spirit of the Lord is going to come upon you as it is upon them. And this uh, big strapping farm boy who is pretty unspiritual, actually, when you look at his life before this, uh, he's going to actually prophesy to the surprise of all the onlookers around there because they couldn't believe that big strapping farm boy who didn't have a spiritual bone in his body was prophesying. That's why they came up with the saying, is Saul also among the prophets? You've got to be kidding. <laughs> That's the right response. Anyway, uh, and then, it's, then it goes, even goes on to say, and you, you will be changed into another man. That was the potency of the spirit upon a person in the Old Testament time. Now in Jesus, what do you think the potency is? Boy, that's up the ante, <laughs> whatever they call that. Uh, so he, Saul could have been changed in another man. And boy, had he stayed with that, his kingdom wouldn't have ended in failure. Enough of that. That's a message for another time. But anyway, uh, so he goes on to, we can go on from there to look at the New Testament descriptions of people receiving or being baptized with the Holy Spirit. And there's the word, with. Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17, when he teaches the disciples about the coming of the Spirit, he says, he will be with you. We already talked about him being called alongside of you. And every believer has him called alongside of him. But then Jesus goes on to say, and he's talking in the futuristic tense when he ends up in verse number 17, and he says, and he shall be in you. What's the first two letters of intimate? In. in. You got it. He shall be in you. Now, the long and the short of this is, well, before I say that, let me remind you that there's also scriptures that describe the baptism of the Holy Spirit as being, as receiving, receive the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul uses in Acts 19, but it's also filled. There's the in coming into play. Filled from the inside out with the Holy Spirit. He's not just a pawn as in the Old Testament. He is just coming inside of you and wanting out like he wants out of me right now. I wanted to tell you a little bit about human weakness because after 40 years of being in ministry and doing this stuff, I can wake up in the morning and somehow, some way, I'm kind of down to my bare bones, just human self. Not being spiritual or nothing, still a spiritual person. You know, God doesn't eradicate your human self with its weaknesses and and shortcomings and failures and fears and all this kind of stuff. He doesn't eradicate that when we get saved. He gives us overcoming power over it though. But anyway, and I think about the sermon I gotta preach. I'm not kidding you, I still get butterflies. I still can start sweating. I'm a scared little man in my human self of declaring these incredible things of God. I'm a scared little human being. And then I turn to the Lord as I have my devotions or whatever. 
I start praying in the spirit, and that can be English or tongues. And I'll tell you what, the fire's back in my bones. And I'm ready to be a lion. Hallelujah. That's what the Holy Spirit does for you, folks. Who doesn't want that? (laughs) So when uh, Saul, who became Paul in the New Testament, got saved, God called a servant by the name of Ananias to minister to Paul. Saul. He needed ministry to because he was blind. He had scabs on his eyes from the bright light that he saw. It burned him. It done did a a welding job on his eyes. And so Ananias goes to brother Saul. He was a little afraid of him yet because he was such a terror to the church formerly. And he says, brother Saul, I've come that you may receive your sight And he says this, now Saul's already converted on the Damascus road, remember. So this is a second work. And receive the Holy Spirit. I should say received, he used the word filled. And be filled with the Holy Spirit. And Paul later uses that in Ephesians Chapter 5, verse 18, Paul talks more about being filled with the Spirit than baptized in the Spirit. But it's the same thing, folks. It's all of the above. Upon, with, in, filled, receive. It's all of the above now in the New Testament. We receive the completion in Christ. We get the complete package. We're living in a good time. Hallelujah. So Paul says this to the Ephesian brothers and sisters. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is dissipation. That means don't waste your time, don't waste yourself on the stuff that the world offers as a substitute for the Holy Spirit. Don't, that's why he compares and contrasts a little bit, wine and the Holy Spirit. And when you see how some of us act in the fullness of the Spirit, you start to wonder what we've been drinking. Remember the apostles, or the 120 in the upper room? That those guys are drunk. That was one explanation by some of the scoffers. Anyway, uh, but he says, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, the English translators don't, don't do justice to the verb tensing there. because, And it's a little awkward, and so they avoid that. So, anyway, they say... Uh, that the right translation of of the verb tenses is be being filled. Does that sound Dutch, Eric? (laughs) Maybe maybe a Dutch ought to do some translating. (laughs) Be being filled. Okay? So here's the thing. Some of you might think, you know, well, I received the Holy Spirit when I was saved. So what are you talking about? Well, ongoingly, we need to be being filled. Amen. Your car, unfortunately, these days with gas prices, needs to go to the gas pumps every now and then. Or you ain't going nowhere, right? You'll be going nowhere fast. So we need to be being filled because our tank runs out. You're filled so that you can go out and pour out, you know, remember our slogan, uh, come be filled to go pour out, and you get poured out out there. Somebody really is testy in your world, and you feel drained. Yeah, you, you should feel drained. That's, that's legit. Now come be filled up. That's what church is all about, where the saints get filled up. And I'll tell you what. A couple of Sundays ago, uh, I, I was in the service sitting back near Eileen there, and Pastor Luke gave an invitation for us to pause in our singing worship and just take our issues before the Lord. Any of you remember that? I, I, I never had such a refilling experience as in those moments. I stood there and I, I almost felt like my feet were off the floor. 
I felt so lightened, so filled, so like I wanted to fly. And, and so that's what I'm talking about, folks. He wants to be, let's be being filled. Now, what are the baptism? Are the benefits of the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Number one, number one, I'm going to say this word, tongues. Remember, when the apostles, when the 120 were filled in the upper room, they spoke with tongues. Now, some people contend that that's, that's the initial evidence. And that's, that's the only one of the gifts. That's, no, that's, that's not right. We don't have to be dogmatic about that. I, I know a man who is very zealous for the Lord. Sometimes his zealousness got him in trouble, in fact, years ago in a church that I pastored. And uh, he, he claimed he was baptized in the Holy Spirit and he, could, he had the gift of prophecy. And I believe that he did. And I accepted that. And time went by and in his zeal, he was fervently desiring to be able to pray in tongues. And he couldn't, and he couldn't, and he couldn't. And all of a sudden, one Sunday morning, he came to church and he had been blessed with the gift of speaking in tongues. Was he baptized in the Holy Spirit prior to that? Yes, he was. And so, just want to clear that up. But I do believe that it is a, a leading thing that God gifts a person with when they're baptized in the Holy Spirit because in the Spirit we're praying. We don't know what we're praying, but our spirit is praying. Our mind is unfruitful. We're praying mysteries to God. And I believe firmly God is dealing with the inner shambles that are still in our life from our life before Christ. I firmly believe that. And, one of, and most of us come to Christ like that, don't we? So most of the time, it will be the gift God gives a baptized person in the Holy Spirit, as it was for the believers in the New Testament. Time after time, they were filled with the Spirit and spoke with tongues. Now, there were some when it says they received the Holy Spirit, period. I want to do justice to what the Scripture record is. So the next thing is that the dove, we have the symbol of the dove here uh, in the four square symbols. The dove descends upon us as it did upon Jesus and becomes an active part of our life. Now, I was uh, tempted to investigate that and look into that from Genesis chapter 8, verse 6 to 12. When, Noah, when the flood had, was receding and Noah was getting curious, can we go out of the ark now yet? You know, and man, putting up with all them animals and that stink, you know, this is kind of like, let's get out of here. <laughs> I would have thought he thinks. Anyway, uh, so he sends out, it's funny because he sends out two very different birds, doesn't he? He sends out a black raven, first of all. That black raven, in a sense, didn't do a thing for him. It flew back and forth looking for a place uh, looking for whatever, and basically the end of the matter is it was looking to serve its own needs. Then he sends out a dove, and it comes back the first time, and it's like, uh-uh, however a dove could shake its little head, beak. <laughs> Don't go out there. And then he sends it out again. This time, this pretty little white dove comes back to Noah with an olive leaf in its beak, saying it's safe, and olive leaves represent fertility slash fruitfulness, and things will be fruitful. Noah was an orchard man, and so it was safe, and he would be fruitful in the way the dove led. Sound familiar? The dove is like the fulfillment to the promise that we have in David's Famous Psalms 23, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake and keeps us pure as he is pure. Fire, fire purges the chaff from the wheat in our lives. Uh, he, he purges us as Jesus said of Peter one time that Satan sought to sift him as wheat and, and the purpose was to separate the chaff from the good grain in his life. 
You know, every one of us is a little wheat field. God wants to bring good grain and good bread from, for people to consume the bread of life. Jesus, the bread of life. So uh, those tongues are a uh, fire that represents that purging, purging. Fire purges the earth. When I hunt where they purge the earth with fire, there's no ticks for a couple of years. Praise God. <laughs> oh, that's so wonderful. Anyway, now, I looked in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, it says that there were as divided tongues of fire. Divided. I, thought, I said, Lord, what does divided tongues mean? And the answer came simply, they could speak in their, with fire in their known tongue. They could speak with fire in unknown tongues. You see that? Divided tongues. And I'll tell you what, us Pentecostals, we have sort of committed the error of saying that uh, when, uh, when the preacher's preaching in the known language, well, that's all well and good. But boy, somebody speaks in tongues. Now the fire fell. I don't know about you, but I got fire in my bones right now, and I think I'm speaking with a little fire in our known language. That side of my tongue speaking. Okay, we cleared that up. Now, a sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind. After I was baptized in the Holy Spirit around 1974 in association with this church, but at home at the time when I was baptized, I had a lot of counsel from the youth pastor and so forth. I was walking in the field one day on a windy day, and the wind putting pressure against a dead limb on a tree caused that dead limb to come crashing down. Immediately, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, that's what I'm doing in your life. I'm pruning you to be fruitful. Got it? Anointing for being made whole is what the Holy Spirit brings. Hope infused overcoming depression. People who face depression are oftentimes in the dark tunnel vision of not seeing outside of that tunnel and seeing the hopeful things God has in store for them. The fullness of the Holy Spirit brings those hopeful things to mind that they can put their faith in and have joy about. It's also a catalyst to set our minds. Paul uses the word setting our minds in relation to two things, setting it on the flesh or setting it on the spirit. That word set in the original language means to fasten to. Like George, when you screw a screw into a stud to fasten something to it. We can set our minds, screw our minds fast to the things of the Spirit more readily when we are filled with the Spirit. It just almost comes, it follows suit. And then the oil, anointing for wholeness. And we talked about inner healing through the speaking in tongues, mystery of the Spirit. Now, I want to say, you may be here today and you know that you have the Holy Spirit. You've seen him working to bring you to Christ. You've seen him working afterward. He's called alongside of you. And you're thinking, well, what more do I need? Well, I think you saw some of what more you need today. You're immersed in the Spirit. This is what I believe firmly in my heart happens. When my daughter was in high school, she accelerated her education and diminished her time in education by taking college classes while she was in high school. She expedited her time having to go to college and her experience. She accelerated her education. And I believe people who enjoy the fullness of the Holy Spirit are expediting and accelerating their growth. So, Let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 47. The vision of Ezekiel speaks of the river of life flowing from the threshold of the throne of God. And he speaks about walking in it near the threshold of the throne of God, and it's only up to his ankles. Then he goes a thousand foot, and it's up to his knees. He goes another thousand foot. Uh, cubits that is another thousand cubits it's up to his waist 
And then he goes another thousand, and it's so deep, you have to swim in it. I believe those are descriptions of levels of immersion in the Holy Spirit. And he's a gentleman. He doesn't force himself upon us. We choose the depth of water we want to we want to be in. And I'm telling you, I'm calling all swimmers today. <laughs> I'm calling you to swim in the river of God. My, my daughter made a little song back in the day about walking in the river of God. Uh, her and my, my wife, uh, they excluded me. I don't know why. You know, it was my singing voice <laughs> from singing it. They'd sing it in the car as we were going to vacation trips and all these kinds of things. But, you know, we don't make icons out of the apostles. But what we do do is we look at their values. And we say, what values for growing the church and growing them up in Christ and doing the work of ministry did the apostles have? And let's go back to that concern Paul, to these Ephesian new, new believers, he says, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? This was a burning concern in the hearts of the apostles. In ministry, we got a little derailed from that in some places. And other things have become the burning concern to try to grow the church. But this is key. When the Jewish Christians at Jerusalem heard that Samaria of all places, remember the feud between the Jews and the Samaritans? Had received the gospel. Of all people, they send two empowered Popeyes, Peter and John, to Samaria, and it was for the, purp- the sole purpose have the Samaritans received the Holy Spirit. And Peter and John go galloping off from Jerusalem, going to Samaria, unkosher Samaria for kosher Peter. It didn't matter. And may I say, he was like a Popeye breaking through the walls of ethnic prejudice. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is one of the greatest answers to that problem. It starts on the day of Pentecost. When all kinds of people from all ethnic backgrounds, all languages, heard the gospel in their language. And so, God's promise, God's GID, I call it, God's initiative directive is for us, through all that has been said, (laughs) to be filled with the Spirit. Praise God. I invite you to be a swimmer in the spirit today, to be immersed in the spirit today. If you have been in your history, remember, you leak. (laughs) You run on empty sometimes. You need filling. If you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you know what? We, We can't make it complicated because sometimes Peter wasn't finished preaching and the spirit fell on those he was preaching to. Wouldn't that be something? P- Peter's still waiting to finish his sermon. <laughs> so, and, and Paul the same way. He, he just barely had his hands laid on people and they started speaking in tongues and prophesying. And Pastor Luke and the church band is going to take over at this point and the invitation is going to continue. 